how do you maximize the coding capacity of the viral genome so you can make more than one protein? You don't want to be limited by this monosystronic rule. So here are the different ways that viruses do it. And what, what, we, what I've listed here, the different mechanisms in what virus families do them. So they're poly, making a polyprotein is a good way to make many proteins from a single mRNA. We talked about some examples of that, the Picorna and the Flaviviridae. Some viruses make subgenomic mRNAs. They make multiple mRNAs from a single template. So that's another way to make many proteins. You could have a segmented genome like influenza and rheoviruses. That allows you to make 8 or 10 or 12 minimum different proteins, one per segment. You could do internal initiation. So we just saw in the cricket paralysis virus genome how you can get two independent initiation uh, sites on a single mRNA with an iris. And then there are a number of mechanisms we haven't mentioned, and we'll go through these one by one. Leaky scanning, reinitiation of translation, suppression, and uh, ribosomal frame shifting. So let's just review polyprotein synthesis first. This, of course, is done by picornaviruses shown at the top. The genome has a long open reading frame. It's translated into a long protein, and the protein is processed by two viral proteases to give all the final viral proteins. So you can see this is a very straightforward way to, to overcome the monosystronic restriction. You only have one mRNA in this virus, as far as we know. It doesn't make any subgenomic mRNAs, so it just makes a polyprotein. And a number of viruses do that. Uh, here's an example at the bottom of uh, a flavivirus that does it. And again, you make a polyprotein and you process it, in this case, by both viral and uh, host proteases. Leaky scanning is another way of making many proteins from a single mRNA. And this is an example from the genome of a paramyxovirus. These are negative stranded RNA viruses that make subgenomic mRNAs. So it makes a number of subgenomic mRNAs. And we're looking at one of them here. And this mRNA can encode multiple proteins. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven minimum different proteins. So how does it do that? This is a capped mRNA. Ribosomes bind the 5 prime end and they begin to scan. As they're scanning, they reach the first initiation triplet, which is an ACG at base 81. So this is not an AUG, but ribosomes sometimes will initiate at ACGs. They use the initiator met tRNA, which will weakly base pair with this, but still works. So you can get a little bit of translation initiation there. But most of the ribosomes don't initiate there, and they keep going. So you make a little bit of this C' prime protein. And most of the ribosomes continue to scan. They get to 104, where there is an AUG. And some of them initiate there and make a P protein, which is a different protein, different reading frame. But this is not a good sequence context, this AUG. The surrounding sequences of the AUG will influence translation initiation. And the sequences, and we call that the sequence context. And the context at this site isn't very good. So again, most of the ribosomes keep going. And then finally you reach 114. And this is a good AUG in a good context, so the remainder of the ribosomes initiate there. There are also two uh, downstream initiation sites at 183 and 201. And these are initiated by ribosome shunting. Remember the mechanism where ribosomes load on the 5' end, scan a bit, and then they leap over distances in, in here. They're leaping down to AUG 183 and 201. So two more proteins are made there. And just to show you how neat this mRNA is, there is another protein made by editing at this site. So this is a variant of uh, the P protein at this site. In some cases, uh, post-transcriptionally, bases are added to the mRNA. So when they are translated, it changes the reading frame so here you get a different protein which terminates right there. So you would get the P protein, which uh, shifts to a different reading frame past the editing site and then terminates. So this is one way that you can take it to the extreme. You can make a lot of proteins from a single mRNA, laughing in the face of the monosystronic rule, I like to say. Another mechanism for making multiple proteins, 
from a single mRNA is reinitiation of translation. Now, I spent a bit of time telling you that eukaryotic ribosomes don't reinitiate very efficiently. Once they translate an open reading frame and reach a termination codon, they fall off and they don't like to reinitiate at a downstream open reading frame. But under certain situations, you can get reinitiation of translation, and we've got two examples here in viral systems. At the top is a messenger RNA from a herpes virus, cytomegalovirus. This um, mRNA has a main open reading frame. It's in blue here. It's called the downstream ORF. But there are in the five prime non-coding region of these mRNAs, small open reading frames. They're called upstream ORFs. And they can be translated by ribosomes. The ribosomes, when finished translating, will keep scanning. They don't fall off, and they reach the downstream off. So they reinitiate translation. Another example below is an influenza virus mRNA, which has two open reading frames in it, the M1 and the BM2, and they overlap, as you can see. The ribosomes initiate at the 5' prime end. They translate the M1 ORF. They reach a termination codon, which is shown here, this UAA. But then they move one amino acid, excuse me, one base past that terminator, and they find an AUG. Actually, the A of the AUG is the last base of the termination codon. So the ribosomes keep translating, but it's a separate protein. So they have reinitiated. They make the BM2 protein, which begins right there at that AUG. So two mechanisms of reinitiation. So because there are ways to reinitiate after termination, let's look a little bit at, at this termination process and see how this might work. Now, the way termination works on an mRNA, the ribosomes have been translating, uh, and they reach a termination codon, which is shown here as the amber codon. Remember, there's three kinds of terminators, amber, ochre, and umber, three different sequences. And these termination codons are recognized by specific termination proteins. They're called eukaryotic termination proteins, ERFs. And ERF1 uh, binds to the termination codon. It mimics a tRNA. It sits in there, has high affinity for the termination site. And what it does is dissociate the growing polypeptide chain and then cause eventually the ribosome to dissociate together with some other uh, termination proteins. Now, there are viral proteins and sequences that antagonize this dissociation. If you dissociate, you're never going to reinitiate. So there are viral ways to keep the subunits together. So, for example, there's a protein of HCMV, cytomegalovirus, and the reverse transcriptase of HIV actually uh, antagonize the um, dissociation of the two subunits and allow reinitiation to occur efficiently. Uh, influenza virus, the sequence we just looked at, allowing reinitiation. So let's go back. This little sequence right here promotes reinitiation so the ribosomes don't dissociate. And there's another such element. It's called an RNA cis element in the feline calici virus genome. So reinitiation of translation just doesn't occur randomly. It is stimulated by viral proteins or viral sequences. Another way to increase coding capacity is by suppression of termination. And here... Let's go through the termination process again. We have a ribosome moving along mRNA. It's made of protein. You can see it here. The protein chain has grown. The protein is attached to the P site tRNA right here. And now we have a termination codon. This is recognized by ERF1 and 3. ERF1 mimics a tRNA and sits in the termination site, and ERF3 is associated with it. This causes release of the peptide chain and dissociation of the two subunits. However, occasionally, these stop codons are not recognized by this ERF1, but, but by a tRNA that has an amino acid charged to it, and that's called suppression of termination. So just think that there's a tRNA in here instead of a termination protein, and then you can see that the translation will continue, and you keep making a protein. So you can imagine that some of the time you would get translation, you make one protein, and some of the time you would get suppression and make a longer protein. So here are two examples of viral genomes where that happens. On the left is a retrovirus genome. 
Uh, this is an mRNA actually made from a proviral DNA embedded in a host genome. It's made by transcription of the provirus. It encodes two precursor polyproteins, a GAG and the Paul protein. There is a stop codon between them. Here it is right here, UAG. Most of the time when ribosomes translate GAG, they terminate at this stop codon and fall off. But about 5 to 10% of the time, this stop codon is suppressed by a tRNA that has an amino acid attached to it. And therefore, you can get synthesis of a gag pole fusion protein. And this allows you to make, among other things, the reverse transcriptase, which is essential, of course, for replication of these viruses. Now, you don't need much of the RT. And so having an inefficient suppression lead to RT synthesis is not bad. It works. Just downstream of this terminator is a pseudonaut. Remember, a pseudonaut is a stem loop RNA structure where the loop is base pairing to a downstream sequence. And this is essential for suppression. If you mutate this pseudonaut so it doesn't exist, then you don't get suppression. And what's thought is to happen is that the pseudonaut impedes the movement of the ribosome. It briefly makes the ribosome pause and that may enhance suppression for some, for some mechanism that we don't understand. On the right is an example of a Toga virus where the genome is a plus-stranded RNA, and when it, is, when it enters cells, it's initially translated. Ribosomes bind the cap. They translate this open reading frame, and then they reach a termination codon right there, that purple sequence. So they make this protein P123. About, again, 10, 5 to 10 percent of the time, you have suppression of this tRNA right here. So you can make a, a longer protein, P1234, and that allows you to make a RNA polymerase for the virus. So these four proteins constitute the RNA polymerase. So again, you don't need a lot of it, so the, the suppression you get, 5 to 10 percent, is enough to make uh, active levels of that protein. So that's two examples of suppression of termination. Now when you get suppression, it typically can involve either a specific suppressor tRNA that recognizes termination codons, and, and they put in a very special amino acid, for example. In this case, selenocysteine is, is used to suppress UGA codons. So these are rather rare codons or tRNAs in cells, but they do exist. Or in some cases, normal tRNAs may misread termination codons and put in an amino acid. And that seems to be enhanced when you have secondary RNA structures in the area of the terminator that cause ribosome pausing. And finally, the last mechanism we'll consider for enhancing or enhancing the coding capacity of a viral mRNA is ribosomal frame shifting. And the, the example we'll use to illustrate it is, again, a retroviral genome, where, again, the mRNA has to encode two different precursor proteins, the structural gag precursor and the Paul precursor to all the enzymes that the virus needs, including the reverse transcriptase. You remember I showed you an example where these two proteins are separated by a, a stop codon. In this, in some retroviruses, the proteins are encoded in totally different open reading frames, overlapping open reading frames. So again, most of the time when this mRNA is translated, the ribosomes bind at the 5 prime N. They translate the GAG protein, and then they reach a terminator here, and that's the end of it. So you get this protein, GAG, which is then processed to form the structural proteins. But again, at a low frequency, maybe 10% of the time, these ribosomes, upon reaching the end of the GAG open reading frame, they actually back up one, one base. They shift into the minus one frame, and they continue to translate, in which case now they've gone into a different open reading frame. They bypass the terminator as a consequence. They don't see it as a terminator anymore. And they, they continue to translate the Paul open reading frame. So you get a gag Paul fusion. And that can be processed by proteases to liberate the RT, among other things. So again, you don't need a lot of these enzymes, because after all, they are enzymes. And, and frame shifting is enough to produce them. So let's see how this might work. This is a model for this minus one frame shifting, again, when the ribosome backs up one base. So you can see here the ribosome has two 
amino acyl tRNAs in the A and the P sites. They're base pairing very nicely with uh, the sequence on the mRNA. And here's the termination codon, which would cause the protein to end, and which does so most of the time. But in some cases, uh, the, the ribosome slips back one. And now you can see not bad base pairing on the slip back, right? There's this mismatched AA here and a mismatched UU, but there's enough to keep this stable. And then the ribosome begins to translate. Um, and you can see here now the next uh, triplet is no longer a terminator. So let's go from UAG. The, the next thing that was going to be recognized here would be the terminator. But now because the ribosome has gone back one, it's now recognizing AUA as the next triplet. So it puts in this isoleucine here instead of terminating. So now we're in the minus one reading frame, and we can keep translating. We go over this stop codon, and we make a longer protein. It's a pretty neat way to to overcome a stop codon, I think.